I wasn't experienced enough. I was too young. We were just branded thick. Nick Jones, the founder and CEO of Soho House. With an empire of private clubs around the world. It's the most see and be seen type of place. Not everyone gets in. Your upbringing is particularly compelling to me because you were somewhat counted out. I'm hugely dyslexic. People didn't understand it then. You were just branded thick. Wow. There was not much choice for me. You've created a business which brings a lot of people joy. That first Soho House on Greek Street, why did it work? I wanted to prove that hospitality could be done differently. I can't think of a time where I was thinking about making an aspirational brand. I've always been obsessed about the member and that was always my number one thing. They've created that. If you don't make mistakes, you're not pushing yourself. You're not taking yourself out of your comfort zone. Maybe I was trying to prove to my family that I, I could do this and I think that's an invaluable lesson. At what point does that desire to prove something need to be contained because it might come at the expense of like life balance? Um, a very good question. And I think... So without further ado, I'm Stephen Bartlett and this is The Diary of a CEO. I hope nobody's listening, but if you are, then please keep this to yourself. Nick. Thank you for being here. Um, I have to say, I'm a big fan of the, the business you've created and, the, and the, I know you don't like the word, but the brand you've built um, for, for many, many reasons that I'm excited to get into. Maybe because I'm a marketeer, but maybe also just because I'm a, I'm a customer someone, and someone that loves the, the Soho House um, brand. But where I wanted to start with you is where I always start. And your, your, um, your sort of origin story, your upbringing is particularly compelling to me because... Um, by many accounts, and even your own, you were somewhat counted out. Is that true? Well, my childhood was, I, I don't think I'd say I was counted out. I, I was, you know, in a nice middle-class family where I had two older brothers and a sister, younger sister, mum and dad. Um, but my two older brothers um, were, you know, they were the, the sort of stars. They were, the, <clears throat> they, they were great at school. They were good at sport. And I was a bit not so good at sport and not so good at school. And it was a sort of different sort of um, sort of childhood that the, I suppose that they had. And, um, yeah, I think it probably put, put me in good stead. But at the time, it was probably quite tricky. When you say not so good at school, what do you mean specifically? Well, just really bad at exams. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm hugely dyslexic. And um, so I find spelling really difficult. I find pronunciation difficult. I find, um, you know, all sorts of things d difficult at school. I mean, I've since learned that dyslexia is the greatest thing to have. And, but at school it isn't. But I was lucky enough um, that my mum was all over it. And it was discovered that I was dyslexic at the age of 12, which is very young for a lot of people are still discovering you know, contemporaries of mine are still discovering a dyslexic right now in, uh, at, at the age I am, which is 58. So I, I, was, I was lucky and I got support and I sort of got through school by weird things like they, they'd give you extra hours on your exam, but I didn't need that. I, I, I only needed half the amount of time anyway to fill up the paper because I didn't have enough information. <laughs> so, so to get another hour was just another hour of just fiddling around with your pencil. So, um, yeah. The perception towards dyslexia today is, is it's quite a common thing and people understand it a bit better. But back then, I'm assuming people didn't really understand what it was or mm. there was a stick, was there more of a stigma? Yeah, I, th I think so. Oh, you, you're just branded thick. And, you know, because if you couldn't read or you couldn't, um, write prop I mean my handwriting is still very not I, I try and avoid handwriting at every possibility so it's still um really bad and I I think yes people because people didn't understand it there but people understand it now and people talk about it and they should talk about it and it's to me it's you know if you have dyslexia you look at things very differently because you have to look at things differently you have to simplify things and by simplifying things, I think that gives you uh, a different perspective on things. 
When I say counted out, I mean more in the sense of um, you didn't believe that you would be a success when you were older because of the, because especially when you're at that young age, you assume that those that are getting the, the best grades and spell the best and do math the best are going to be rich and successful. And then there's us, there's everyone else. So at that young age, you didn't see, you didn't envisage you would be a quote unquote success. I, it, it didn't, I didn't think either way. I was just sort of thinking of just getting through school and, and, and I wasn't really planning that if I was going to be a success or not a success. And I, I think that's a interesting um, how you define success. Um, and I don't think success is just being successful, you know, running a business or creating a business. I think it, it touches all sorts of things. Was there... Um when I was reading about your parents' dinner parties, that seemed to be the first uh, inspiration for what you would later do in hospitality and restaurants and, and creating experiences for others. Was that the first sort of spark of inspiration for you? Yeah, um, I, I, I was, while my brothers were on the sports field, I weirdly liked doing the supermarket shop I, with my mum. You know, I, I found supermarkets fascinating. I found food fascinating. I then found the whole preparation of how to give people a good time, you know, fascinating. And, you know, I loved watching how you, how you could create an environment where people had a laugh and fun. And was that what your parents were doing? Well, yeah, they, um, not all the time. I mean, occasionally they did it, but, um, but when they did do it, it was, it, you know, I loved to be part of them trying to create a fun evening. And I think that's probably where I suddenly realised that, you know, hospitality was the, the route for me um, because I, you know, we're going back a long, long time. Um, you know, this was, you know, I'm 58 now and I was sort of 13 at the time. And, and I was, I used to, you know, go to the local sports club and work behind the bar, you know, as a clean the glasses. And weirdly, I enjoyed that. I enjoyed the interaction with people. I enjoyed seeing people just have a have a nice time. And, and back then, people were not going into hospitality. I mean, it was really at the bottom of a ladder of, of industries that people went into. So I thought that was an opportunity. It, it's funny, because I've sat here with um, Jimmy Carr and lots of comedians. And when I hear about their sort of in, an inspiration for becoming a comedian, it, it tends to root back to them being younger and it being the thing that they would see create the most joy in their home. So in the case of Jimmy Carr and Russell, um, Russell Howard and a few of the other comedians I've sat with, they tell me the story about like the thing that would make my parents the happiest was when I would tell jokes. So that was this sort of psychological reinforcement that led me to be a joke teller for the rest of my life. And when I was reading about those, those dinner parties that your parents had, I was, I was, and also confounded by the fact that you, you know, you said in your own words, um, you didn't feel like there was a lot of conventional opera, um, avenues available to you because of your dyslexia, that that was the the combination of factors that caused you to well and 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 I really had to I mean when I was at school I because I wasn't good at getting exams so I had to rule university out I had to um, there was there was not much choice for me you know there was a person with very few O levels as as they were called then and I think I got an E and an A level I scraped through on economics I think and wow. You know, with that, there, there was there, there there was really not a lot of choice, and you know, my careers master at school sort of said, "I think it's catering, Nick." <laughs> you know? Really. So when my when my careers master said that, I've, I I sort of thought, and and also the fact that I thought there was real opportunity in this, and my my dad owned a small um, insurance broking company, and my brothers went into work there. And <clears throat> I think my dad was keen for me to go and work there, but I, I didn't find insurance very exciting. <laughs> I still don't. <laughs> and, <laughs> and, and I didn't find that world of working in the city and insurance and being an insurance broker interesting at all. So I, I did have that as an opportunity, but I really felt I wanted to try hospitality and catering. As you as you started your journey into hospitality and catering, did you start to at any point figure out that you were you had some kind of area of brilliance? There was something you were good at compared to others. No, I remember clearly the first. No, I, I didn't. The answer to that was is definitely no. Um, I my 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 first day, I I, I worked for Trust House Forte. I was a, a management trainee, and it was a five year course. And I I, I applied to the Savoy management. 
um, training course to start with. And they, I, I, I remember it to this day, the interview I had, um, and I just froze. I couldn't speak. I was so nervous. I, I absolutely froze. And because I was a pretty shy kid and, you know, I, I was shy at 17 when I was going for these interviews and I just was, it, I, I just got stage fright. I just couldn't, my mouth, no words came out of my mouth. And I didn't get into the Savoy management course, but then I applied for Trust House Forte. And luckily when I went for the interview, <clears throat> I was able to talk and I got onto a, 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 a five-year course and my first part of the course was a year in the kitchens and it was at St George's Hotel in Langham Place which is just here in London um, off Oxford Street and you know, I arrived and the chef looked me up and down and he 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 called me a nickname which I'm not going to say with on, on this it began with a C and and um, he threw a sack of potatoes at me which sort of landed in my belly and he said peel them and so I went off to the, the area where you peel the potatoes and I hadn't really ever used a knife before and I, the first one the first potato I cut my 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 finger and I thought oh god how do I hide the, hide this and the, the water I was putting the potatoes in was getting redder and redder and redder and I and I thought oh no this is my first day and the nickname stuck um and I I, I was really sort of learning on the job, which I think is a really great way to learn anything. And I kept making mistakes, but I, kept, I was determined to, to sort of fit in to the kitchen because it was an environment, you know, because I came from this sort of cotton wool, um, middle class background. And then going into the kitchen into the early 80s, where, where you know, it, 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 they, it was long hours and, and, and they... They, you know, someone who comes in with a slightly posh accent, and you know, they, 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 they it was, it, but it was a, it was a good moment. It was a good moment for me. Was it? Um, what was it about that? Because that sounds pretty horrific. Sound, and I've having worked in a kitchen. My my mum had a restaurant at a very young age. I started working there at seven. Super high stressful. People always complaining. It's hot in there. Um, that and I mean, people weren't throwing things at me and calling me the c word, but. It wasn't, it was really unpleasant. So I'm wondering what, in that context, like, despite of all of that, tickled your fancy. But well, do you know what it was? It was, I was coming out of my shyness. I was learning how to get on with people. And, you know, I was, I went to a private school. I was surrounded by people who went to private school, which is 7% of the population. Mm -hmm. And by going into the, 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 the um, kitchen, you, you really learnt to, really get on with everyone and uh, and I think that's an invaluable lesson and I really became friendly with a lot of the chefs and would go out with them at night and I just enjoyed it and even though it was hard I just enjoyed the environment I enjoyed creating food I enjoyed the buzz I enjoyed I didn't mind the heat I didn't mind the fact that it was it was it was long hours I just enjoyed it if I'd spoken to maybe your colleague or someone that was maybe above you and a line manager at that time and said, what isn't it good at? What would they have said to me? I, I'd like to think um, not peeling potatoes or making porridge, <laughs> but, you know, getting on with people and being part of a team and, and getting st stuck in. You said earlier that dyslexia was, um, is actually a great gift. Can you explain why um, why you've now come to believe that is, that is a real sort of superpower for you? Well, I, I, I wouldn't say it's a superpower, but I, I, I talk a lot about dyslexic because I really want people to feel that if they have, if they, if they get the tests and they're dyslexic, I don't want them to ever feel bad. I want them to feel good and go, well, this is a huge opportunity because I think when you look at things differently and the reason, one thing being dyslexic, I have to simplify everything all the time. I have to... I have to, I, I want something on one sheet of paper. I don't want it on four sheets of paper. I want, I, I, I want everything to be scaled down and simplified. And I think we live in a world where everyone's overcomplicating things always. And, and you know, and it, it doesn't matter what area of the business I work in now, whether it's the designers or the chefs or the tech people, you know, it's all overcomplicated. And I spend a lot of my time just editing down and, and, and simplifying it. And I think dyslexic, being dyslexic has made me do that, you know, because it's the easy route because complication panics me 
and confuses me. So I spend a lot of time simplifying. And I think when you do simplify things, people understand it, they get it, they like it. Yeah, so true. Someone once said to me that a phrase I always forget, which is um, if someone's ability to simplify something also correlates to their ability to truly understand it. And typically when you meet these like salesmen that are um, trying to blag you in some way, they purposefully overcomplicate something. And sometimes they don't actually understand what they're saying, but distilling it to simplicity gets it closer to truth. And it's, it's also a sign that the person communicating it really truly understands the essence of the idea or, or the concept. You, by 22, you started your own restaurant chain. Well, I, I went round lots of departments within Trust House Forte, from front desk to bar to 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 to, to housekeeping. I was a housekeeper at the you know clean the rooms at the, the Westbury Hotel in Conduit Street. I I was a barman at Brown's Hotel in Albemarle Street. Um, and yeah, I remember clearly um, you know serving you know, being the barman and. I remember making cocktails for George Best. That was a yeah. that was a highlight of of you know, he was such a nice guy and 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 I, I suppose at that time I always thought the determination was to open something to to open my own restaurant. This is you know I, I want to l learn this and then I ended up doing marketing at Trust House Forte and then I was marketing manager at Grover House in in Park Lane and it wasn't because I was brilliant at it it was you know I was cheap you know I, I just was I was I didn't just cost a lot of money and they could that's what they were looking for at that precise moment and but I always when I was working there I was always working on a plan to 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 you know not work for Trust House Forte which was a big big hotel company and I was thinking you know I, I want to get out of this at some stage I don't want to keep going on the ladder when you know you keep getting put you hopefully I would have being promoted into other jobs, but, and then it would have been too difficult to leave. So I thought I want to go when I'm still relatively at the bottom. Mm -hmm. And then I, I went and tried working in fast food restaurants or sort of casual restaurants. You know, so I went to work to Maxwell's and Covent Garden mm -hmm. as a night manager. I then, I then went um, to work at Pasta Mania as a sort of junior manager. And then during that time, I was building my plan to open my first restaurant, which was called Over the Top. And that opened in 1988. And it was, you know, it was, I was too young. I wasn't experienced enough. Um, it was, it was terrible. <laughs> it, the, uh, the design, which is something I'm obsessed with now, and I love design, you know, and I, that was my first design outing. And it really was terrible. Um, the food was, you know, really bad. You know, my friends had to come. You know, and that 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 showed. I really knew who my friends were because <laughs> mm. they would come and support me in the restaurant. But it was uh, it was it was it was it was a a good experience of getting something really wrong. It's not cheap to open a restaurant. <clears throat> how did you how did you fund that? At well, I I my my dad put a bit of money in. Family friends put a bit of money in, and I got to the bank to put some money in. Um, so I was lucky. You know, mm. I was given that chance to be able to open my first restaurant. Um, and it's something you know. I, you know, we we do a lot now. I, I love people doing that. When anyone comes to me and wants to be an entrepreneur and start something up, I really make time to see them and help them. And you know, I was lucky. I was given an opportunity, um, and yeah, I, I learned a lot. That I guess would increase the pressure if you've got family betting on you. Yeah, I, I, I think it, I, I, I never, they never made me feel like that. Um, you know, my dad, you know, um, I think he was proud that I was trying to do something. I was trying to do something on my own because he had his own small business. Um, but he never made me feel like that. And the other shareholders, you know, I think in their head, they, they when they first came and tried the restaurant, they sort of probably knew that it wasn't going to lead anywhere. But actually, you know, the, the the company is still the same company as it is today. It's a it, it never went it never it never went bust. We 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 hang on in there and um, you know eventually opened Cafe Bohem in ninety two um, with which was really all the experience of getting over the top so wrong. And uh, let me explain what over the top was. It was it was it, it you either chose a burger, a piece of chicken, a bit of lamb, or a steak. And over the top of it, you could choose one of ten sauces. 
Right. But the sources were terrible. <laughs> and 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 it was just it was just bad. And um, you know, uh it 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 just sort of taught me, you know, how to manage a business with little cash and with no cash, how to pay the staff every week, how to use initiatives to try and get more customers in. And I think it taught me at a very early age, you know, marketing restaurants is not the way to solve a restaurant. You just have to make the restaurant good because the customer is so clever. They know what good is and they know what bad is. And it taught me that very early on. There was no way that you could, you don't, you can't fool a customer. They, 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 they know. And you could walk into Overtop and you could sort of feel, you know, you could sense that it wasn't, 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 wasn't good enough. But what I learned at that time was it, it sort of, it, it, I didn't feel it was a failure. I just thought it was, I was on a, a, a journey of learning. And I really, even now, encourage all our people that making a mistake is not a problem. You know, if you don't make mistakes, you're not pushing yourself. You're not trying. You're not. You're not. You're not taking yourself out of your comfort zone. And so, you know, I really encourage people to think that you know, failure is not what it sounds like. You know, it's, okay, it's just part of the journey. What did What did that process teach you about feedback? I, I asked that because in my first business, I was I had this it was a tech business, and I was very romantic about this hypothesis about the way that I thought my customers would behave and about the solution that I thought that they would care about. And I spent too long not listening to their feedback. And ultimately that was pretty fatal. And I just wish earlier I'd been less romantic and stubborn almost about what I thought the customer would want and, and, and listen. But I'm wondering what that first failure taught you about the importance of what feedback you listen to and how you listen to it. And well, I think feedback's key. Um, and People be not. It's funny being being a Brit. People are funny about complaining, aren't they? They're, yeah. they're, they're in restaurants. They 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 think it will offend you. They 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 think. Well, I'm not gonna. I can't complain to Nick about I had a bad meal last night because he he might be. You know, that might upset him. But to me, you know, you can only get better by getting really honest feedback. And I'm lucky now because I have members who all have my email address. And 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 you know, they 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 if they're not happy, they they email me. So I think listening to feedback is super, super important. Did you listen to it in, at over the top? Well, I could just see it because there wasn't many people to give feedback to. <laughs> <laughs> I wish there was more customers in there giving me feedback. Um, but, you, you know, people did give feedback. And, and, but I didn't have the tools to be able to get it better. I didn't know, you know, you start, I started going down a, a sort of, because we kept running out of money. So, you know, you kept cutting, cutting the, you know, the team down. So there just wasn't, you know, it, at the end, it was sort of just me in the kitchen serving. And we even set up a delivery service to try and try and try and um, uh, booster sales, but that didn't work. I, I was so um, <laughs> really inspired by you saying that the customer is smart. And also you, you alluded to the fact that the best marketing is word of mouth. Yeah, absolutely. That, that really is at the heart of what you even do today is, is I, a belief in the customers. Yeah, own. I, I'm very lucky that we have fantastic members who are loyal and, and you know, they, they you know, I, I, if anyone says that we've done okay or I've done okay, it's for thanks to our members and... Um, you know, our members of the people who pushed me from doing So a House, you know, the original So a House on Greek Street, where you know, it worked. There were hairy moments, you know, when I thought it really wasn't going to work, um, and you know, it, it would go quiet or it would go. You know, I, I remember <clears throat> the first year we opened in in May, it suddenly gone quiet. And we'd opened in January. And I thought, oh God, that I thought it would last a bit longer than this and you know a member turned around to me and said well, well Nick, they're all down at the Cannes Film Festival you know that's where your members are so I suddenly thought well next year I'm going to go down and create a pop-up down there and this was pre-pop-ups you know this was in 96 and so we rented a boat um, uh, in the harbour and I remember <clears throat> in fact I remember clearly because there was there was a 
a lady who still works for us to this day, Veronique, and, and her and I had to fill up this lorry full of stuff in London to, to drive down to, I didn't drive a lorry because I couldn't drive a lorry, but to go down to the south of France, Cannes, and we opened this boat and it was like a temporary club for the 10 days of the Cannes Film Festival. <laughs> and members, you know, if they weren't in London, they could come to the club in, in the, 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 the boat in the harbour. And that, we did that for lots of years and it was I think our members really enjoyed that and that sort of taught me again where wherever the member was going go so you know because if I hadn't you know I was I didn't understand the film business or the media business I was in catering hospitality so I was I was I was sort of new to this and you know when I first first created the first ever committee at Sower House you know I was really knocking on doors and and phoning people cold calling them and saying do you mind? And and you had to sort of explain what you were trying to do to get them to come on the committee. And that was where our first 500 members came from. And and I think there, I've always just listened to a member. You know, they, they kept saying, well, Nick, it's great, this one. Why didn't you do one in the country? And I go, ooh, let's do one in the country then. So off I go. I, I phone Savills up and I say, any any hotels for sale? I didn't have any money, but I thought, well, I'm going to go on that route and see how I could I could um, get 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 somewhere in the country. And I remember stumbling across Babington House, and and I remember it was it was on the market for um, you know a million million and a half pounds. Um, this was back in, yeah. in a long time ago, and and. Um, I remember driving up the drive and as soon as you have drive up the drive at Babington, you sort of fall in love with the place. And I fell in love with the place and I thought, oh my God, how, how, how am I going to get planning permission to turn this into a hotel and how am I going to have enough money to buy it? I had just a small amount of money just to put the deposit down. And luckily, um, the people who were selling it, um, they, they, um, they said, well, we want to stay here for the summer we you know we want to we we want to exchange and then we will complete in nine months time and I thought yes <laughs> you know and then it gave me nine months um um to um to find the money and get the planning permission and raise the money with our members to 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 pay for the completion mm. and also to pay for the refurbishment and I, I I sort of just remember even before we exchanged the agent phoned me up and said, you know, um, a higher offer's gone in. So I was sort of being gazumped. And I thought, well, I don't have the money anyway, so I can put another couple hundred grand on it. Cause of, uh, and so I, I increased my offer. <laughs> I, I got Babington House and, um, you know, I was able to raise the money. We And we raised the money through our members. You know, we're, lots of members put sort of five grand in, um, and that's how I was able to get the money to open Babington House. So it was a, it was a, led by our members. Sort of the, the the members helped invest in it. You know, they luckily have all got their money back plus plus. And um, you know, then that was the second thing we opened. That first Soho House on Greek Street. Why did it work? You know, I was running the restaurant downstairs, Cafe Bohem. That yeah. was my survival. Cafe Bohem was, you know, it was the same company as Over the Top. It was, it was, it was me doing everything totally different to what Over the Top was. So the food was edible and nice. <laughs> the, the service was good. The atmosphere, you know. And if, if I was in there last night and it was, you know, it, it made me very happy because it was packed and it was fun. And when the building came up, a, 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 available above Cafe Bohem, which is on Greek Street in London. Um, I, the landlord phoned me up um, and they said, well, do you fancy taking the space above? And I go, well, what on earth for? You know, there was no plan to do a private members club. But my plan was just to survive and make Cafe Bohem work after four years of attempting over the top. And I still do this today. I always look at everything. I, when people phone me and say there's an idea, I always go and have a look. And so I, I said, okay, well, I'll go and have a look. So I wandered around the offices and it was a small door, you know, um, on, on Greek Street, 40 Greek Street. And, and I thought, hmm, hmm. And I hadn't been to a private members club. 
you know, I wasn't, I wasn't part of a Groucho club. I wasn't, I wasn't, I wasn't part of that, 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 well, it was only the Groucho club, or there were all those clubs down in Pall Mall. I wasn't part of that. Maybe um, that's a good thing. Yes. And I, and I, I looked around it, I was like, oh God, this is like a home away from home. And, 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 you know, God, this is, this could work. How could I, how, you know, this, this, this is an idea. So, but I didn't have any money. So, um, again, and um, I went to see um, my landlord, which was Paul Raymond. Um, and I, I went to see him and he said, well, you, do you want to take it? And I said, well, yeah, I'd love to take it. But what could, would you invest? Because the family investment and for over the top, they had had totally enough. <laughs> they, 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 they were out, you know, the banks were trying to pull out of you know, trying to get their loan back. It was, th that bit of it was, you know, just, it was, it was, it was that bit of the family help was done, finished. And so I thought, well, how am I going to raise the money for this? Because it's going to be separate. I'm going to have to do this separately to what Cafe Bohem is. And so I went to see Paul Raymond. He said, I'm not investing. I don't invest in other people's businesses. And then it was when I was leaving, he said, well, what happens if I put the money in, but just added it to your rent? So you ended up with a higher rent, you know, a mm. percentage of the money he put in was added to my rent. And, and I thought, well. To do the fit out. To do the fit out. Um, and I thought, okay, well, that sounds like it can work. So I set up Soho House. It was, it, it was simple to come up with a name. It was a house in Soho. The logo was pretty simple. It was, was it, it was, it was so simple. It was three buildings, three floors. Um, and, and I, and, but I owned a hundred percent of it because the Cafe Bohem lot, you know, my, my family didn't want anything to do with it and, and the other investors. And I thought, well, you know, when Soho House works, I'm going to transfer everything back to the, you know, the same percentages as it was as <clears throat> when it was over the top. So I merged the two companies. So I didn't want, um, I didn't want to be a success on one hand in, on, on Soho and, and they were suffering on Cafe Bohem and over the top. So we merged it all together and, and we found the members and, 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 you know, a lot of the people who, open so house in 95 still a part of so house to work um you know uh, the guy pierre who was a server in 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 um the blue dining room the, the, the blue room in the in the restaurant now runs north america for us and um <clears throat> marcus anderson who is runs our membership part of our membership team who was a server in one of the dining rooms so uh, the guy marcus barwell was a barman in the circle bar and now he's managing director of so house design so yeah. it's lovely seeing you know people who are right there at the beginning still be part of a company now and it it but it was it, it was a journey as well it was it, we were moving into this sort of new area of membership understanding membership understanding looking after people and, and just listening to your members because I'm sort of going back to your original sort of feedback question. So the feedback, and which comes from our members, has sort of really helped us where we are today. Was Café Bohème successful when you embarked on the so house journey upstairs? Yes, okay. <clears throat> but it was having to be on top of the disaster of Soho House. So it was a, quite a lot of, <laughs> it was a lot of sort of, um, it was the same company. And and so, yes, it worked. Cafe Bohem worked. It gave me the confidence to do something else. It it worked because, um, it it you know it was it was thirty years ago. So and there weren't many places. I don't think there were many places which were opened at eight in the morning and closed at three in the morning. And you could go in there and eat whatever you wanted or just have a coffee or just have a drink. It, 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 the kitchen was always open. You could, you know, drink jugs of beer or you could have a steak frit or, and we had jazz in the afternoons. It was really creating, it, it sort of really created a real regular following within Soho. And it was the, the turning point really of the disaster of overtime. <laughs> I had a few words to say about one of my sponsors on this podcast. For many years, people have been asking for a 
coffee flavored Huel. And quite recently, Huel released the iced coffee caramel flavor of their um, ready to drink Huels. And I've just become hooked on it over the last couple of weeks. I've been on a really interesting journey with Huel, which I've described and talked about a little bit on this podcast. I started with the berry ready to drinks, then I moved over to the protein salted caramel because it's 100 calories and it gives you all of your essential vitamins and minerals, but also gives you the 20 odd grams of protein you need. And now I'm balanced between them both. I drink mostly the banana flavor ready to drink. I've got really into the iced coffee caramel um, flavor of, of Huel's ready to drink. And now I'm drinking that as well as the protein. Make sure you try the new ready to drink flavors. The, the caramel flavor is amazing. The um, new banana flavor as well is amazing. And obviously, as I said, the iced coffee caramel flavor has been a real smash hit. So check it out. Let me know what you think on social media. I see all of your tags and Instagram posts and tweets about Huel. Back to the podcast. So when you look back then on that Soho house, a lot of people I'm sure started very similar style businesses around the time. I'm trying to figure out why Soho house went on to become what it is today. What were the the factors that, in your view, you talked about customer feedback shaping everything, but... Well, I would, I, I would give that accolade to our members. I would, I would say it was the members who pushed me. And, and you know, when they, when we opened in New York, you know, they, because uh, we, I think we'd opened the electric house. We'd, we were about three then, and and someone said, "Well, you, you should open in New York. I'd love this." And I thought, "Ooh, yes, maybe." So off I go to New York and 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 determined to open a Soho house in New York. First of all, look in the re- district of Soho, um, and couldn't find something. Going came close. It was difficult learning permitting. It was it was just difficult and. Um, I remember we found the warehouse. It was an old electrical warehouse and meatpacking. Yeah. Meatpacking was a very different place to what it is now. Um, it was run down. It was, you know, it was it was full of sort of, it was full of really interesting life. <laughs> and and, and uh, I remember we found this, 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 this warehouse and I thought, okay, I'm going to, Get, get the warehouse. And again, we had to raise the money to do it. So it was a question of trying to, um, how do you get raised money in New York? Because we, we, you know, the, it was it was sort of a bad time in the UK. It was sort of, I, I think there might have been a recession going on. So the, the banks were, oh, you're not going to, we're not lending you money in New York. So I thought, okay, well, I've got to start raising money again from our members and from people in New York to put money into the Sower House in New York. And um, I, 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 it was, everything was nerve wracking. You know, the, the, the week I was flying out there to try and get the permit to be able to allow to open a club in the, in a warehouse was 9-11. So I arrived on, I think it was a Monday evening and I was nervous because it was this big, big meeting on the Thursday where in, in front of a local community board to see whether we'd get permission to be able to open up a, a club and have a license in the, in this premises and i was having breakfast um on the tuesday morning the, the 9-11 um and i was having a boiled egg i remember it and as i was hitting my boiled egg i heard this big bang and, and i thought what is that so I, I ran out on the street and i looked up and i could see one of the twin towers with smoke coming out of it and I asked, um, <clears throat> there's a guy sweeping the street. And I said, well, what happened? What? He said, well, a plane went into the side of it. And I said, well, was it just a, what did it look? Was it, he said it was an airliner. It was, so it wasn't like a private plane. And I thought, oh my God. So the first thing I did was phone Kirsty, my wife, because um, she was in news then. She was a news presenter on ITN. And I said, I think, think maybe you should get into work. <laughs> There's something going on here. And, and, then, and then I was still out on the street and I saw the second plane go in. You saw it come in? Yeah. Well, you, you, it was coming in from the, the river. So you didn't actually see it coming in, but you saw the impact of it coming in. And, and then, you know, that day was, it, it made me really fall in love with New York. It's sort of the relis- resistance of the people, uh, how how they cope with it, how they. It was it was it was amazing the people of New York that day, um, and that that week, and 
And anyway, weirdly, the community board still happened on the Thursday. And I went up and did my presentation. I said, I, I, I don't know why I'm doing this. It seems irrelevant. It seems not, not something we should be doing, but you know, you're, you're running the meeting. There was a lot of other points on the agenda. So I was just one of them and we got our permission. Um, and that's how New York started, but it was a big, big sort of um, race to find the finance. And I was calling everyone. I was, I was calling everyone. I did more show rounds of that, 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 that warehouse building, you know, running up and down the stairs, showing people around, trying to be enthusiastic. And then, you know, I, I was sort of getting to know people in New York and I put together this hard hat dinner um, where I, I, I don't know how it happened and I don't know um, why it happened, um, but, you know, the really well-known people turned up to this dinner and we had just had a six burner on the sixth floor and we cooked some chicken and we laid up the table in the building site on with a white tablecloth. So it was real grit and glamour. <laughs> and it was, it was, and, and these people just turned up. And I remember David Bowie being there wow. and I'm going, uh, and I, I remember I was so nervous. I was, I, 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 and I, and I, I started talking to him and he said, <clears throat> this is a great idea. Can I buy it? And I said, well, there's nothing to buy at the moment, but can you invest in it? Yes. And, and so he was one, he was one of the investors of, of, of Soho House New York, which was fantastic. And, and, and then momentum came and we rose, raised the money. <clears throat> Everyone sort of before that was saying a private members club wouldn't work in New York. You know, it, it, the, the, it, people wouldn't pay a membership fee people treat their restaurants like private members clubs and the velvet rope was the big thing in new york um and i wobbled so often about should we charge for membership and, and every I, I was so nervous opening so as new york and i remember the opening party um and it was raining and they hadn't finished putting the roof on <laughs> and and, and people were staying in the hotel and there was no water. So we had to borrow the showers at the local gym. People had to go down to the local gym um, for hot water. We had water, but there was no uh, hot water. And it was just this roller coaster of an experience opening in New York where we didn't quite have enough money. Um, and, <clears throat> you know, the team, you know, my, we were carrying sheet, sheet rock or it's plasterboard over here and sheet rock over there. Mm up to the floors to try and finish them we're putting the ceilings in and and it was a it was a it was a it was a journey but then eventually we opened <coughs> and it, it worked it sort of people sort of took to it why bother you know like you had a great business here in london you, you know things are going well why, why put yourself through all that pain um a very good question and i think i could have just carried on doing things in London, but I, there, there was an ambition in me. There was, you know, there was this, this thing about being a Brit and going to New York and trying to take the thing which I loved in London and see if it worked in New York. And it was, and it, and at points it nearly took the whole thing down. And, but I really felt at the time that if it did bring the whole thing down, at least I tried. At least I gave it a go. And I wasn't going to be sitting in, in a rocking chair thinking I didn't give it a go. So I think there was a sort of inner something in me which wanted to see. And maybe it was sort of going back to my childhood when my brothers were so good on the sports field or, or good at school. I was trying to prove a point. Because I, I sense that a lot, even when you had this you know, successful cafe, for you then to take the risk of taking upstairs with an unknown idea just because someone said it's available. And it's that, you know, some people are more like the, I don't know, they stay within the zone of comfort and they just harvest, but you have this hunting sort of predisposition as well, even when things are going well. So what I, there's something inside me. Um, maybe I was trying to prove to my brothers, my family, that I, I could do this. And, and yeah, I, and I do always look at 
things in a positive light. I do look at things, I, you know, if I look at a glass of water, I'd say that's half full, um, not half empty. And, 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 and hospitality, I wanted to prove that hospitality could be done differently. And I think with Café Bohème, where we opened it all day and it was chameleon, it just kept changing to the time of day it was and putting jazz on in the afternoon and just sort of making it much more customer focused where you would go out 40 years ago and kitchens would close at 2 p.m. and you couldn't eat in the afternoon. And I think that was something I, I felt I was onto something to be able to make it better for the customer. And that sort of took me back to when I liked helping my mum and dad at, when they had people around for supper. And I loved seeing rooms of, full of people having a good time in Cafe Bohème. And lo I loved laughter. I loved people connecting with each other. I loved people enjoying themselves. And I think, I just thought, why don't I just carry on doing this? At what point does that desire to prove something need to be <laughs> contained? Because it might come at the expense of like life balance. You know, this question I've asked myself a lot, it's like when you are successful in one thing, you have more opportunities to go and do more things. And then you might end up being pulled so much by your ambition and your desire to prove a point or your insecurities that you then end up compromising all of these other things like friendships and the other things that make life fulfilling. Yeah, and I, it's, a, it's a balance I've never quite got right. And I'm super lucky I have an incredibly supportive wife, Kirsty, and she, she sort of really went on the journey with me. And I know without her, you know, I wouldn't be, you wouldn't be asking me onto this podcast. And, um, you know, so she's been a great support. Um, and my kids, you know, were sort of part of, you know, they, they had to come to work, they, you know, when I was doing the rounds, on a Saturday morning or during weekends, I'd have push chairs and toddlers and, you know, they, they were just part of what was going on. And it had to sort of merge into one thing. And what I've successfully done is try and demerge it and have, you know, a, when I'm at work, I'm at work. And when I'm at family, I'm with family and that, but that's taken a long time. So the, 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 the balance is, is something I think all entrepreneurs s suffer. When you say it's a balance you've not got right, what was the indicator that you didn't get it right? How do you know you didn't get it right? What was the symptom? I was always knackered. I was always <laughs> sort of pretending not to be. <laughs> uh, I was always sort of, you know, um, yeah, it was, yeah, I was internally coping with all the pressure where I could, but I wasn't doing that very well. Uh, um, so I think it was sort of a, a combination of, of, of just realizing that, you know, this was all com consuming. Uh, it was, it was, it was really dragging. And, and I was very lucky. I had, you know, great friends who are still my friends from when I was a kid. Um, and I didn't see them enough. And you sort of, in our business, hospitality, it is weekends, it's nights, it's days it's 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 all the time and when you take it to a different country then you have to think well the days just got longer and and and, and it's got five years you know go to new york got five hours longer and so yes it, it does take its toll what is that toll you said about coping with pressure well i i i, I think you know I, I i sit here today and i think i'm lucky because i think i got a great you know, I, I, I have great relationship with my kids. I, you know, it's my favorite thing is being with the, with the family and being, being, being with them all together. Um, so, um, but I, I think at times when you're trying to prove yourself, I'm trying to prove that I could work in New York and America. I was trying to prove that we could open solar houses in other parts of the world. I, I think it, 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 it was hard, but, you know, you suddenly then do realise that you have to sort of balance it. 
is was there was there points in your journey that it was particular so the pressure becomes so much and you almost feel within your being whether it's your health gives out or your your mental health or you get anxious where you think this is not this is not sustainable i i i i never thought it wasn't sustainable because i'm always such a positive person but i think you know Kirsty was great you know she kept saying you know we don't need any more this is we don't need another house the world doesn't need another house nick <laughs> you know for, 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 you know you don't need to be on a plane all the time what who are you what are you trying to prove and and there was a stage where i was buzzing around everywhere flying here flying there and and thinking it, it was all making a big difference but really and i think the pandemic taught me that was the fact that there's better ways of using your time and what are those better ways of using your time? Well, you know, instead of buzzing around on a plane all the time and spending 12 hours in a city and then going to another city or doing one night in one, you sort of where, you know, the teams are clever enough to put on a bit of a show for that, that, that period of time. So you're not actually seeing really what's going on. And it was just smarter ways of doing it. And, and, and also having a lot more trust in the senior leadership team and uh, letting them get on with it and thinking that I didn't have to be everywhere for it to work. And actually, often it worked much better when I wasn't around. And, and, and I mean, I, 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 you know, because they were able to just get on with it and not worry about what I was thinking all the time. That sounds like great advice for a younger version of Nick at the start of the Soho House journey. What else would you say um, now in hindsight, you wish someone had, maybe they said it, but you'd wish you had known about how to achieve, get to where you are now or further, um, but in a more effective, whether that relates to health or finance way, what would, what would be that advice you'd give to that Nick starting out on the Soho House journey? Well, I've always been obsessed about the customer, the member, and that was always my number one thing and the people who work for us. So they, they were my two obsessions. And I, the advice I think I'd give to a young, young, young Nick would be, you know, let them take more don't think you have to you know your team you know put it more onto your team to get on with it and don't try and do everything yourself and also you know there's a there's a point when you have can prove yourself that you can these things can work globally and you know there's a time when you know you have to really properly delegate and let other people get on with it what are the you know because one of the things that so house is known for is this quote unquote brand. And I know you don't like that word, but this very, um, I think I'd say it was an aspirational brand. People want to be a Soho House person. How much in intentionality, I don't even know if that's a word, has gone into making that brand aspirational? I, I, I can't think of a time where we had a time where I was thinking about making an aspirational brand. I think it, that's, and if that's people's perception, great. I'm really, I'm, I'm, I'm. Uh, that that sounds good. <laughs> and I, I, all I concentrated on what our members wanted, and um, they've created that. They have created the, the 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 fact that you know there's a desirability to be part of Soho House and. Yes, we and we and we got a brilliant team, brilliant membership teams globally. We got we got people who really care, people who have been on the journey for a very long time, and I think with their help and with every house, we have a determination to make it better than the last house. You know, we always start with a fresh piece of paper. We don't think, well, you know, let's just keep repeat, repeat, repeat. We go new, new, new. How can we make it better? What are we going to change to make this better? What are we going to change to make it more efficient? What are we going to change to make it better for the member? And I think our members really appreciate that and they see that and they talk about that. And that's probably what's created what you have just described. What has um, hospitality taught you about life? Everything. I sort of think, you know, um, it should be the national service. It, you know, people should go and do a year in hospitality because I think it teaches you so much. I mean, I spoke earlier about me going into that kitchen and really learning how to get on with people and from 
different backgrounds, different countries, different different everything. And I think it really teaches you, you know, to be part of a team and there's a customer, there's all your, you know, people you work with in the kitchen or the person cleaning the dishes or the person, you know, cleaning the rooms. It, you all have to work together to make it happen. And I think so it really takes the shyness out of you and it gets, gives you an ability to get on with people, which I think is a really useful tool. I think it's better than a, a, a maths degree, <laughs> I think, getting on with people. I think um, you learn, you know, just useful practical things like making a bed or keeping a place tidy or clearing a table of plates. And, and, and when, you, when you've got a family gathering or something, you can suddenly clear the plates and stack them up or you can... You can you can make a cocktail, you know, which is really nice. You know, you, you, that doesn't you don't even if you're not in hospitality anymore, you can still make a cocktail. You can still make a bed. You can still hopefully get on with people. You can still, you know, clear a table. You're, you 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 have to become quite organised in your mind. And I think hospitality is a very rewarding industry for that. Hospitality is quite a it's quite a broad term, but at the crux of it, what do you think it is that you're actually selling to people? What what are they buying from you? Well, I think what we want our member to do is flourish. You know, we want them to flourish socially and we want to, them to flourish, <clears throat> you know, at work. And I think creating memberships and you know, that word community of people who are sort of like-minded and, and they all have a creative soul and you put them in, in one house, you know, that is like, you know, they, they bump into each other, they talk to each other. I've seen businesses created, I've seen relationships created, friendships created, ideas created. And, and I think when you put people together in a space and, and, and it, that, is, that is pretty special. And to see that happen in different countries and different cities, to see members sort of really using the fact that you go into the house you can just go into the house on your own just wander down there and you know you'll bump into someone you'll start having a, a drink with someone or a cup of coffee with someone or you and you're sort of you you're in the house you're part part of a, that membership and i and i you know people do it you know a lot now and you know you can do it digitally and they use algorithms and <laughs> they use all sorts of things and i think you know being part of so house and you know those 500 members i talked to you about earlier you know they're still part of us they still pay their membership if they're, if they're still here they're still part of it they don't give it up and and so you have, on one hand the, the original founder members of 27 28 years ago and then on the other hand you got you know huge under 27 membership going into our houses you know, huge you know it accounts for 22 23 percent of our overall membership you know under 27s and it's it's seeing in a room, you know, the most successful scriptwriter in one corner, and on, in another corner there might be the struggling scriptwriter who's still trying to write, you know, their first script, or you know, the art, a really well-known artist or an artist who hasn't sold a, a, a new painter who hasn't sold their first bit of work, and you know, and taking that and and trying to think, well, how can the person who's done it help the person who wants to do it and yeah you know, that's why I'm so passionate about our mentoring scheme you're where you know there is so much creativity in the world and there's so much creativity you know and and creativity is not owned by the middle class <laughs> it's it's everywhere and to to be able to offer mentoring um to people who are less fortunate who might be, not be able to afford them a membership or might not know what door to knock to get that opportunity is sort of one of the favorite things that we're doing at my favorite things I'm doing at the moment is seeing it happen so going back to what you were saying about creating people in a room who all help each other they all feel like they're looking out for each other they all want to help the person who who's down on their luck or who is 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 starting out or they want to help the 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 you know they want to create an idea with another bunch of members and i think that 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 is that is special and it goes back to seeing 
people in a room having a great time and and if our members can flourish in in their lives if if so has can just make their lives just a little bit better then i think that's a good thing are you naturally a shy person i think so because it's funny because when i i meet entrepreneurs there's various different types of entrepreneur and um so once in a while i meet a, an entrepreneur and a founder that's created a really great business but it's quite i think the word is unassuming as in they're not very self-promoting you know you ask them certain questions about what their brilliance is for example and they they don't necessarily point at themselves they tend to defer it to others so it just made me it's it's it's, it's curious because it's kind of unconventional to meet an entrepreneur that's so that feels so unassuming in a sense uh, in terms of not having a huge ego <laughs> i guess um because because the question i was going to ask you and my head is going he's probably not gonna 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 he might defer this to some, something else is you've created such an amazing business and it's such a, a wonderful brand and it's it's a, admired by people that are customers and that aren't customers just for for the business but i can't seem to get you to tell me um why you, out of everyone else that was trying to do this, were successful. Because I got the ambition piece. I've got that persistence and that that persistence that comes from that childhood sort of maybe chip on your shoulder. But 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 I know there's more. Well, I'm. I can only tell you what I'm. I I think and yeah. I what I I I do think is, you know. Uh, I, I love what I do. I'm lucky. I get up every morning. I have a skip in my steps. Uh, you know, I'm skipping around. I'm, I'm I'm looking forward to getting to work. I I I have a fantastic team around, and um, you know, I care deeply. And if that all adds up to it working, that's the reason why. Because mm. it was never for me a money play. It was more a a, a, a thing that I wanted to try and make hospitality you know and I, that is a I, I used to say catering but i've upgraded it to hospitality and <laughs> and to make hospitality a sort of area of where you can change it you can you know when we opened babington house you know it was the first country house hotel where you could get breakfast when you wanted when there was no rules it was it was it was you know your your bedroom at babington house was probably nicer than your bedroom at home so people would come down and go well, Nick, you know, um, you know, where do you get that TV? Where do you get Sky? That's new. I'm going to put Sky in my houses or I'm going to, where do you get those sheets? And, and so I'm not trying to avoid your question here, mm. but I'm just trying to, again, answer how I feel and I, well, why I do it. I did get something more from that, which is just your care, yeah. how much you care. And your passion and your care seem to have a, a relationship together. But, and that's that's so important because a lot of people would be launching it for money and therefore they'd care about something else whereas you really seem to care centrally about the customer experience more than anything else well I, I think i always say to our team as sort of a, if, if if our people are happy and the, the members are happy then sort of everything else will look after itself because mm. your places will be busy and if you mm. if you're smart and you're cost control it 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 everything else should be fine do you think you're a success I, well, I, I think I said earlier, but success, you can judge success in lots of ways. Um, you know, I'd much rather be judged as a father than as <clears throat> someone who runs a business. And, you know, I suppose you'd have to ask my kids that. Professionally, do you think you're a success? I, people tell me a lot and I, I suppose I have to listen to them. In, <laughs> in, the, in, 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 in their eyes, I'm, I, I, I've I've done all right. In your you know, I I'm still there. I'm still, you know, we're we're still growing. It's, you know, sales go up. You know, it's 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 a good business. In your eyes? I think so. I think if I was to be honest, I couldn't sit here and look at you in your eyes and say, "No, I don't see what I've done as something which isn't successful because it because it works and when things work, I presume that's a success." And so what's next then for 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 you? I mean, tremendous business all around the world and it's becoming so much more than just houses what is the big next mental challenge ambition excitement well we're recently public yeah. um and you know we went public during the pandemic i'm enjoying that challenge really yes i'm enjoying it i'm enjoying 
dealing with, you know, and I view all the analysts as smart and and I think it's making us a better business. And I think, um, you know, so there's a journey on that. You know, it's, we're only 12 months into it and people understanding that it's a subscription, recurring income, that, um, you know, a third of our revenues come from membership and our, our hotels, our bedrooms are always <clears throat> nicely full and we don't have to use what other hotels have to use to fill their hotels, like booking engines, et cetera. Um, I, I, so I, I think that is a, 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 an interesting future on how to be properly successful on the, on, on, as a public company. Um, and there's so many more places we can open houses. You know, we, we haven't even touched Africa. We've only dipped our toe into Asia. We, we, we got, we're going to Latin America later this year um, to open in Mexico. So there's a, there's a, there's a lot of exciting new houses opening. Um, and being a public company and just trying to get better every day. We have a closing tradition on this podcast where the previous guest uh, leaves a question for the next guest. <laughs> and um, the previous guest has left you a question. They have written, they don't, obviously don't know who they're writing it for, but here we go. Um, if you could go back in time and change one specific moment in your life, what would that be and why? Ooh. Um... I would definitely have come up. I definitely would still would have done over the top. <laughs> I, I, I would have done that. Um, one specific thing, um, I, I, I think I would have, I would have tried to get my life, at my the, the balance between life and 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 family a bit better. Why? Because, you know, running at a hundred miles an hour all the time doesn't always sort of, you know, a, a achieve everything. So I think, I think, I, and I've, I've talked on the behalf of many entrepreneurs and many CEOs and who just get a bit obsessed and, and about their, their, their world, their business. And I think, you know, you, you're slightly better of it if you're not so, if, if you have a more balanced view. Yeah. I was actually talking to one of my friends about this last night that you'll know, um, that runs one of the big, big uh, companies in this country that's a billion pound company and he was we were having the same conversation about just trying to remember amongst all of this ambition that the like the actual most important question is like are you happy yeah and and that's one that um i've definitely lost sight of for many many years of my life in the pursuit of building more and more and more yeah uh, and then eventually loneliness or some other kind of consequence will show up and remind me that i've misprioritized but it's a it's a, it's a great subject now isn't it and I think people come out of the pandemic and they think there is you know we want our lives to be slightly more balanced and I think I think you know that wasn't the case 25 years ago or 15 years ago or when you started your business it was it was you know it was that mission and I think balance is good well thank you Nick thank you so much for your time the generosity with your time and uh, thank you for creating a business that I love and that, I, that I'm probably at every week at, at current rate. Um, and well, that, thank you for being a member. Yeah. A yeah. member. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and, you know, I think most, a lot, most of our team as well, I bought memberships for them as well. And um, you've created a business which brings a lot of people joy. But, but the thing that I actually love the most about your business, which is I think is a bit of a dying um, human Maslowian need, is community. And everything, whether it's the industry I worked in, social media, or whether it's other things, or even rem remote working now seems to be taking community away from us, which seems to be so integral to like hu the hum being a human. And so House uh, and the brand is bringing that back. And I think that's why I would personally bet on that, because I think um, regardless of how the world changed and technology and all of that, we're still going to always um, love and have a desire for community. So Yeah, I, I agree. I agree. Yeah, for the human connection and people getting together and laughter and ideas and not doing it digitally, doing it in a physical space is, is great to see. Thank you. Quick one, as you might know, Crafted are one of the sponsors of this podcast and they make really meaningful pieces of jewellery. This lion piece they've made, I wear 
all the time, along with the little timepiece, the sand timer that I wear often. And the lion piece, you might have seen Conor McGregor has a similar piece, which was custom made for him. For me, it represents courage. And if you walk through my house, the house that I'm in right now, if you walk six feet in that direction, you'll see a huge lion portrait. If you go upstairs, you'll see a lion portrait. If you look behind me on the shelf, near the top there, you'll see a lion as well. The reason my house and my life is surrounded by lions is because they represent courage, calmness, and that tenacity that I've applied to my business success, to my professional life, and to everything in between. For me, the lion has always been an animal that can be almost a bit of a contradiction. They are so loving and so caring of their own and can be powerful and courageous when necessary in order to achieve what they want to achieve. So if you, like me, are a big fan of courage, bravery, ambition, while also being calm and composed check out this line piece and let me know if you get it